<clears throat> there were several things in there that I could talk about, <clears throat> but I want to, uh, Joel 2.13, uh, they were praying, God, you're in the heavens and come down. He did not answer that question. He did not answer that prayer with what was expected to be answered. The answer was, no, you rend your hearts. Now, I don't know how much, <clears throat> I don't know how many prayer meetings you've been to, but you may have been to a lot. But if the prayer meeting is about repentance and rending your heart, and you have that for a theme for a very long time, you'll probably be meeting by yourself pretty soon. And I believe that's a word to intercessors. People that are praying. Rend your hearts. Don't ask Him to rend the heavens. You rend your hearts. See, God is looking to, 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 to take His people to be prepared for His coming. And rending your hearts is what... And you and I can't rend our hearts on our own. You can't make that happen. You can't make anything happen. You didn't get saved because you wanted to be saved. You got saved because He wanted you saved. You get the opportunity to respond to what He's doing, and that's all you get. So, <clears throat> this text today, the eternal bliss of mourning, part 4, from Matthew 5, 4. Can you quote it with me? Blessed are those who mourn, because they shall be comforted. Say it with me again. Blessed are those who mourn, because they shall be comforted. One more time. Blessed are those who mourn, because they shall be comforted. Remember, um, as I said, this is number four in the series, The Eternal Bliss of Mourning. We must understand that the kingdom we are in by faith is a spiritual kingdom and an everlasting kingdom. So that the principles taught in this kingdom are spiritual and not always perceived by the eye or ear and have everlasting substance. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance to be intimate with and obey these spiritual principles in the fear of Yehovah. If we are to be immersed with the Spirit and the truth, we'll have to obey. The point of this message is not so much about mourning over loss, grief, or even suffering, that it is a part of this natural life, but is about a type of mourning for the things of Jehovah's kingdom that causes him to mourn. And maybe it's a new concept for you to understand that God mourns. But God has asked us to do nothing that he doesn't already do. And uh, again, the flesh is not capable of this type of mourning because it is a, of spiritual in origin. I'm going to show you two examples today of where it was tried to be accomplished in the flesh. And that doesn't work. Um, it is a type of mourning is initiated by Jehovah, who is spirit. Say Jehovah is spirit. Jehovah is spirit. He is spirit. The kingdom we live in is a spiritual kingdom. We see with our natural eyes. We hear with our natural ears. We feel with our fingers. But the kingdom that we are in is not touched by your fingers in that way. It's not seen with your eyes in that way. It's not heard with your ears in that way. It's heard in a spiritual way. This type of mourning for the things that God is mourning for is in essence Him sharing His heart or from His Spirit or you could say His burden. You ever hear any of the prophets Read any of the prophets and they say, this is the burden of Amos, or this is the burden of uh, Joel, or this is the word that came to Isaiah, or this is the word that came to Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, this is the vision I had, or Daniel. What that is, is what I'm saying here, it is Him, the Father, sharing His heart with those people. That's what He's doing. He's sharing. He's trusting people with his heart. When he speaks to you, it's a part of who he is, and he's trusting you with that. It's how, it's how he's communicating and building a relationship with you. So I'm trying to say that in order to get you to see that this mourning 
is communicated through different words in the scripture when they're talking to when he's talking to people. Okay? We looked at 1 Corinthians 2.14. No, we didn't look at this, but I want to bring this out. 1 Corinthians 2.14, we're talking about a kingdom that can is not discerned by the nature, by the natural man, but is discerned by the spiritual man. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man does not receive the matters of the spirit of Elohim. The natural man does not receive the matters of the spirit of Elohim. So you can't perceive what he's doing, what he's saying, what truth is in the natural man. It has to become alive. He has to make it alive to you in your spirit. For they are foolishness to him. You know, um, in Scripture in 1 Corinthians says, uh, he's, he, by the foolishness of preaching. Right? You ever thought about how foolish it is to preach? Here's a simple man or a woman, finite in creation, limited in every way you can imagine, and they're trying to communicate about a God who has no limitations, who has no limit to authority, who has no limit to a power, and could do it with one minuscule utterance from his mouth, and yet he asks you to do it. That's foolishness, my friends. I'm just saying, it's foolishness. Because, it says, for they are foolishness to him because they are spiritually discerned. Say spiritually discerned. Are you spiritually discerning at the moment? Are you in carnal reasoning? Are you thinking about what you want to do and what you want to say? Or are you thinking about what God's trying to say to you? Where's your mind today? Are they, they're spiritually discerned. Spiritually discerned. I think I'll say that again. Spiritually discerned. You have to spiritually discern. Do you think that you should be spiritually discerning? When should you be spiritually discerning? You have to go into every... Can I tell you just a testimony? You know, I was uh, doing something I don't do m much of, but someone gave us a tractor to bush hog, and I was out bush hogging yesterday. I ain't going to tell you all the details of what happened. It would be humorous, too humorous uh, to describe. But I'm driving along, and I look down, and the key that turns it on has gone out of the ignition somewhere. I don't know where it went. I don't even know how it comes out of the ignition while you're, the motor's running. I just don't know how that works. I mean, I've never had a key come out of the ignition while it's running before. So I thought, you know, gosh, I ought to look for that or something, you know. And then there was a couple other things that happened. Maybe I'll tell you that part. Um, Sometime, but um, so you know, maybe I'll just tell you the whole story. So, what is happening is the tractor's overheating. Well, the tractor's been running fine the whole time, we've been running it 20 about 20 hours already. And so, I thought, you know what, we've got the dust off the sides, but all that broom say just covered up the radiator. So, I'll turn it off, and that's when I looked down, and there was no key in the ignition anymore. So, I thought, okay. Uh, but I'm going to get off and stop this. But if I turn it off, I can't turn it back on unless I get another key. Of course, I don't know about y'all, but I always have three keys to everything. You might consider doing that. I need three keys to everything I own just because I just need them. So, I always have three. So, I knew I had another keys. So, I get off, I cut it off, and I go out there and clean that radiator off, and I walk around, the tire's flat. The big tire slap. I thought, wow, that's like a whole lot of stuff. And that's not talking about the vulture that just tried to swoop down on my head and bite me or something. I don't know what he was doing. But anyway, or the serpent that was running out from the tractor. But anyway, I lost, the key was gone. So I thought, man, you know, it's like, I'm going to pack it up and go home. You know, I'm just like, we'll come back and do this tomorrow. But I felt like, no, so I said, get that tire of the shop and let him fix it and get it back out there the next day. So I got out there and I thought, I ought to go look for that key. I said, Spirit, God, where's that key? And should I go look for it? He said, don't go look for it. I said, okay, I'll just do what I'm doing. So I went ahead and finished my business. And um, <clears throat> um, I went and finished my business. And uh, a brother went out in the field today and picked his key about a 15 acres of land back there and brought it to me today. <laughs> I mean, come on, at least enjoy it some with me. I mean, 
I didn't even go look for it. The Spirit said, don't even go look for it. I thought, shoot, I ain't wasting my time. I'm going home. I'll eat supper or something. You know what I'm saying? I ain't going to stand here and look for no key. And so anyway, I'm just telling you, you know, things are spiritually discerned. I could have spent hours after looking for that key. And never. I mean, how do you find it? And he wrote 15 rounds of bush hog in it five foot wide. How do you know where that came out at? And why did it come out of the ignition anyway? I just... I ain't even going to try to sort all that out. I got the key back. That's all I need. You know what I'm saying? So praise God. It's spiritually discerned. Even in something simple like that, a lost key. Um, we did look in the past messages. We've looked at Yeshua's example of mourning over the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem in 19, Luke 19.41. He, the Father put it on His heart to mourn over that city. And He mourned over that city because they, the day of their visitation had passed. Friends, this day of visitation for this planet is coming to an end. Are we mourning over it yet? It's coming to an end. But you can't produce that, and I can't produce that. We also considered how Paul was led of the Spirit to mourn over the congregation at Corinth. He was led to mourn. Why? Because they were allowing sin to continue in their body, and they would not address the issues. You can read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, and 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 11. Are you mourning over the condition of God's people? Has that struck your heart yet? We also looked at two prayers from the book of Daniel. One which was removed, the prayer of Azariah, and um, was removed from our scriptures, and later the prayer of Daniel in chapter 9, verse 3 through 19. The reason I gave those prayers out was because they teach the principle and show the results of mourning as God causes people to mourn for things. We read Daniel 10, 2 and 3. I'm going to read them again. It says in Daniel chapter 10, verse 2, In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three weeks of days. That's how it says it in the uh, in, uh, Institute and in Scripture Research version of the scripture. Verse 3 says, I did not eat desirable food and meat and wine did not come into my mouth. And I did not anoint myself at all to the completion of three weeks of days. Daniel was led to mourn for three full weeks. You know, there's been a book out. I, don't, I haven't read it, but it's the Daniel fast. Anybody read that? No? Okay. Well, I don't know. I haven't read it either. But I know they wrote a book on it. But uh, you, can, you can pick up what mourning is going to do for you right here in this text. It means you're going to give up something that you'd like to have, but you'd rather have God in His presence, God in His ways, the things that concern Him more than the things that concern you. Hello? One of the key things that we learn from this text is that when we are spirit-led to mourn, you voluntarily give up things that normally would mean a lot to you. What means a lot to you? Well, it means a lot to me. Think about it. I'm not going to suggest anything, but just think about it. What means a lot to you? What means a lot to you? What do you spend your time thinking about? What do you spend the bulk, the majority of your time thinking about? What do you rehearse in your mind most of the time? What are you thinking about? What are you desiring? What is your passion for? Because that's what, that's what you're thinking about mostly. And that may be the very thing that you're asked to give up. Hallelujah. Here's two examples of flesh mourning. Say flesh mourning. Flesh morning. Can you smell the flesh roasting? Hebrews chapter 12, 12 through 17. It's um, in the end of this text, which I have typed into my notes. Esau and his failed effort to produce spiritual mourning. So you can't produce it on your own. I would like that the Spirit of God would just move on our congregation to mourn and to identify with His heart over the condition of this planet. 
the condition of his people. The pain and the sorrow and the suffering. We have our own, but you multiply it times seven billion. See what's going on in the planet. You'll start crying out for him to return quickly. That's why he wants to come. He wants to end that. So, verse 12, we've just read Isaiah 35, 3 through 4, two Wednesday nights ago in wedding prayer. This is a quote from the book of Isaiah. 35, verse 3 and 4. So, strengthen the hands which hang down and the weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. Lest the lame be turned aside, but instead to be healed. Pursue peace with all men and pursue a partners with which no one shall see the master. That's the one where it says, without holiness, no one will see Yeshua. See to it that no one falls short of the favor of Elohim, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, by which many become defiled. Lest there be anyone who whores or profane one like Esau. Say like Esau. Like Esau. Who for a single meat sold his birthright. For you know that afterward when he had wished to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears, with mourning. You can't produce mourning. It's a gift. When the Spirit of God deals with you about things, you have to respond to Him when He's dealing with you. You can't say, no, I'll do that later when, it's, when I want to do it. You do it when He does it. He's, in, he's the boss. He's the one in authority. But I believe this is a different generation. A different generation. I believe this is a generation of people that are going to do whatever it takes to seek God. To come in alignment. To come into maturity. To come into the place of communion and fellowship with Him. That will produce what He wants produced in the earth. Think about it. Um, are we the generation of Psalm 24 verse 6? That seek His face. I don't know about you, but how do you describe your faith? Or you might call it your Christianity. Or you might call it your believing. Or your following Yeshua. How do you describe that? What term is a directive that you call the way you spend your life? The Spirit told me a long time ago. said, describe what you do as the pursuit of God. Describe what you are doing as the pursuit of God. Not pursuing Him for something. Not pursuing Him about something. Not pursuing Him to get something. But pursuing Him because that's what I should be doing. Is pursuing Him. How many of you, don't you raise your hand or hands, but how many of you would describe yourself as my number one spiritual priority is to be with Him and know Him? Then, of course, you've got to substantiate that by action, right? Come on. Is anybody out there today? What are we going to do different if we're going to get different results in this generation? What's going to be, have to be different? We know what the past generations are capable of. We can look and read about it in books. But what is this generation? What are we going to be noted for? What are we going to be doing? What are we going to, how is, uh, how is our life going to be reflected on? Is it going to be another generation that we live, we ate, we worked, we did our stuff? Or is this going to be the generation that, that God comes back during? Is this going to be the time? Or what are we going to do different than the people before us did, than the sermons before What's going to be different? Why should we respect anything different? Hello? What's going to, what are you going to do different? Listen to more sermons? Attend more prayer meetings? Go to more conferences? 
listen to more teaching? Their generations have done that. That's what got us where we're at, and it's not bad. It's just that's not going to take us where we're supposed to be going. We're going to have to change. We're going to have to rend our hearts. We're going to have to seek God until He rends our hearts. We're going to have to call. We're going to have to come to the place where that's what we want. For Him to rend our hearts. We're going to have to see how bad it is within and without. And it's going to have to drive us to the place to blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Hallelujah. Esau could not produce mourning for his sins. He could not produce mourning that only the Spirit of God can produce and forgive sins. Now let me talk to you about a congregation. It's a congregation called the Children of Israel. Numbers chapter 14. Man, is it quiet in here today? I'm saying. <laughs> Numbers 14, 39 through 45. And I didn't write this down. I'm just going to rehearse the story. It's the story of, of the children of Israel after they refused to enter the promised land. They tried to mourn. And they even tried confessing their sin. And yet, Jehovah was not moved. He told them to go in. And they said, no, they're going to kill us and eat our children. We're not going in there. And then and after... Joshua, Caleb, and Moses prophesied the truth to them and said, this is what's true. God is able to do it. They said, we're not going in, and we want to kill everybody that says we should. <laughs> then the next day, the next day, say the next day. The next day, the next day they realized they had made a mistake. <laughs> they said, we've sinned. But let us go in and take the land. Let's have another prayer meeting, another service. Let's listen to more, to more teaching. And then let's go in and take the land. You always said you go, but I'm not going with you. I'm not going with you. Hello? I'm not going with you. They tried to produce their own mourning and own repentance and attain the promises of Yehovah. And he said, No. Not only did he say no, but he said, every one of you are going to perish in the wilderness. And if heaven is our eternal promised land, then how many have perished in the wilderness? <clears throat> then how many have perished in the wilderness? What are we going to do different in this generation, while we have life, while we have breath, while we have strength, while we have knowledge, while we have ability, what are we going to do different than the previous generations did? If we want something different, we have to rend our hearts. We're going to have to seek God's face and ask Him to rend our hearts. They're calloused over with pride and self-sufficiency. In arrogance. They're encased in the callousness of hard-heartedness and as Esau, embitteredness. The soul of our soul and heart is so hard. It's so unfeeling and uncaring. About, not just about stuff, but about God. About his kingdom. About what he wants for your life. We're going to have to come to the place where our life does not mean that much. It's his life. What he wants is where we've got to go. If we're going to see something different. How many of you want something new? Amen. How many of you want something new? Amen. How many of you want something new? Yes. How many of you want what he said you could have when you have him? Yes. Come on, somebody. Don't be afraid. Even if he gives you the ability to rend your heart, 
you're going to come out smelling like a rose. That's why it was in that song. Public intercession. Public intercession. Rend the heavens, God. How many times have you heard people say that in public prayer meetings? How many times? I got a word for the intercessors. Rend your heart. Stop telling him to rend the heaven until you are willing to rend your heart. He's not listening to that other stuff. I'm, I'm trying to say this in a loving way. He's not listening to that because his response is, you rend your heart. That's what he's saying. Hallelujah. It's time for us to step up to the plate and, and pursue God. We will spend our life pursuing stuff. But we won't spend hardly anything of our being in pursuit of Him. What will we give up? Will we even give up a meal? Will we even give up a a dollar bill? Those mean nothing in the light of eternity. They mean nothing. You will not take one burger with cheese on it into eternity with you. Thank you. You will not. You need a few of them down here. But they ain't going with you anywhere else. Be careful which ones you eat. Some of them aren't real food anyway. <laughs> you know. Hallelujah. So, let me read this to you. This is, uh, I did type this into my scripture. I didn't know I did. 39 through 45. Numbers 14. And when Moses spoke, all these, spoke these words to all the children of Israel, the people mourned greatly. Hello? And they rose up early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain saying, We have indeed sinned, but we shall go up to the place of Jehovah had spoken of. I'm just telling you, it's a picture of a prayer meeting. It's a picture of a prayer meeting. Verse 41. But Moses said, Why do you transgress the mouth of Jehovah, since it does not prosper? Wow. Verse 42. Do not go up, lest you be smitten by your enemies, for Jehovah is not in your midst. I thought they was mourning and praying and saying they'd sinned. There was no transformation of who they were. It was not even God's heart. They didn't even have His heart for the matter. They weren't led. They were acting in their flesh with a religious spirit. And that, my friends, is what's going on today. And most of the prayer meetings, most of the conferences and things that I've been around. i got news for you. If you want what they got in a conference, do what they do to get the stuff they got in a conference. Go seclude yourself with God and listen for a while. You can have your own conference right there, friend. Hallelujah. But Moses said, Why do you now transgress the mouth of Jehovah since it does not prosper? Do not go up lest you be smitten by your enemies, for Jehovah is not in your midst. Because the Amalekites and the Kenites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from Jehovah. Jehovah is not with you. But they presumed, say presumed. Presumed. Presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin. This is another thing he taught me early. Presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin. I'm trying to get that word out right. I'm just having trouble with something. Presumptuous sin. Take an authority where you have none. Take an authority where you have none. Take an authority where you have none. Presumptuous sin. They did not have the authority to go into the land because God wasn't with them. They had an opportunity, but they tried to get in on a second effort and there is their flesh it wasn't the spirit of God at all that's the truth this is where he spoke to this congregation they tried to attain the things in the body of Messiah has really made a hard effort to get to things by the flesh they really have I've been one of them I'm not throwing rocks I'm just saying here we all are what are we going to do different Come on. what are we going to do different friends if you're waiting until everybody everything straightens out and becomes peaceful in your environment, you, you will never change. Thank you. 
you're wasting time. And to pursue just so you can have, this came out Wednesday night, just so you can have less affliction in your life is not the name of the game. Scripture says endure affliction. Not avoid it. Don't pray to get out of it. Endure it. Because Yahovah is trying to reach something inside of you that you are unwilling to give up. You are unwilling to give it up. And it's causing conflict all around you. But when you give it up, you have peace within and then it don't matter what they do outside. Hello? You won't never get wet if you're in the house when it's raining outside. <laughs> in other words, the affliction's going on around you and you're at peace inside. Oh, yeah. It ain't going to rain on you at all. Oh, yeah. Come, on. Come on. Help me out, somebody. Amen. You want good preaching, you have to want it. You can't sit there passive and not get it. It would go right by you and catch somebody that does. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Come on, somebody stir up the Holy Spirit. I'm tired of preaching to dead people. Come on, man. Wake up. I'm awake. Listen up. Ring your hearts, not your garments. Amen. It's just another type of action of the flesh in the text we're going to talk about. So, hallelujah. I got a note here that says, see the next page. I think I ought to look at that. Okay. We said I made more of a note because I don't remember what that means. <laughs> see the next page. Here's what it says, though. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. Mourning all the time. He lamented and mourned so much, he wrote a book about it called Lamentations. How many of you read Lamentations as your favorite book? I mean, you just can't wait to get out of this meeting and go read the book of Lamentations. That's Jeremiah's life. That's what Yahovah was doing for him. He showed him the, the, the suffering, the, the rejection of God's ways for the people of God, not the world, the people of God. Not that he didn't prophesy to the nations, but he saw the suffering of the people of God and how it turned them away from God and they turned to false gods and idols and worshiped them and mixed their worship with Yahovah's worship, thinking everything was good, man. They were in a time of unseasonably warm weather. It was nice outside. Everybody was making a lot of money, doing a lot of good stuff. Just like the dream. But God's word to you and me is rend your heart. Not him rend the heavens. Hello? Yeah. Jeremiah wrote that book. There, and if you read it really good, right in the smack in the middle for about five verses is some hope. But other than that, man, he is just, he is, maybe we don't like that because that's what God was doing. He was causing that man to mourn. Maybe we don't want to hang out with a God who causes people to mourn. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, he's out of, I, 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 I want to hang out with somebody's happy, right? Don't you come around me mourning. I don't want none of that stuff. Everything's bad and broken and busted and I can't get no help from nobody nowhere at no time. Lamentations is a book devoted to the experience of lamenting the destruction of Jehovah's own chosen people. How many people are, are rending their hearts over that? See, we just want to go preach everybody and get them straight. No, that ain't going to help them. He needs somebody that will rend their heart. He needs somebody that will choose to humble themselves and do without what they could do with and ask him to give them a heart of a burden not so they can be dis displayed or so they can make a splash and everybody look at him and say oh well you know a gift or anointing that is no he's, he's calling his people to rend their hearts to rend their hearts blessed are those who mourn is that not a calling to mourn is that not instructions of how the kingdom 
eternal kingdom works? Hello? That's what it does. What about this? 2 Chronicles 7, 14. How many of you quoted that in the prayer meeting? Besides me. Huh? Let's look at that thing and see what it says. Verse 14. And my people upon whom my name is called. And I know this is just my pet peeve, but most people that call on his name wouldn't use his name at all. They're too embarrassed. It makes you different if you start calling God by his name and not some pagan title. Huh? Hello? You ashamed of that? You ain't even, forget 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If you can't cross that bridge, you ain't going nowhere. I mean, I mean, I'm not making that up. That's what the Word says. And my people who my name, upon whom my name is called. See, when, you bless, when the priest bless the people, it put his name on him. My people whom my name is called shall humble themselves and pray and seek my ways and turn from their wicked ways. I thought the unbelievers, I thought the people making bad laws, I thought the communists and the Nazis, I thought those were the bad people that were supposed to turn from their wicked ways. Didn't you? I mean, didn't, didn't you think those were the bad people? Hello? Don't you look at me pious. <laughs> I'm not pious either. He said, he said, and my people, of whom my name is called, shall humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. And then, I'm certain this, then and only then. I'm uncertain that. You heard me say that. I'm uncertain then and only then. I will hear from heavens and forgive their sin and hear their land. See, you know, if you wanted to break this down, which I'm going to do a little bit of here today, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, because we need it broke down for us. Uh... <clears throat> the hearing in heaven and the forgiving of sin and the healing of the land didn't even happen till the first three things got done. I mean, there's an implication here that I'm not really, the sin's not really forgiven and the land's not really going to be healed until there's a real turning from wickedness. Hello? Am I making that up or is that what it says? I, he loves us enough to tell us this. He's requiring me to say it to you. It's not so he can beat you up or control you or squash you or push you down. He's trying to get life to us. He's trying to get the fullness of his kingdom to manifest in our lives. Now look at this. Call by my name. And I, I'm not going to go over my pet peeve again. But that's just a peeve with me, man. Humble themselves. Man, if you teach him a message on humility and post it on the internet somewhere, people won't even look at it because they don't want to hear that. Preach one about weeping and mourning. I don't know if anybody will read that. Because we got to be happy. And preacher better preach me happy or I ain't going to give him no money. <laughs> John, uh, Danny's uh, giving me cues prompting me to help. You'll be a hit. You're going to get lots of it. Well, my kingdom says give it away. Sell what you have and give it away. That's what it says. It doesn't say that or doesn't it? Sell it and give it away. Why? So he can give you real riches. You hang on to these down here. Whatever your hand's full of here, you won't have there. That's it. You won't have it. Pray. We can, we can, some of us can cross the bridge of humility. Some of us can cross the bridge of his name. Some of us can cross the bridge of humility. We spend way too much time trying to figure out how to promote ourselves. And how to gain a reputation. When the scripture teaches that if you seek the honor that comes from men, you cannot have the honor that comes from God, and therefore you have no faith. Hello? So I down. Pray. We can, we can pray. You know, I, I don't know where you're at in your prayer life, but mine's been changed. I mean, the last 10 years, my, life, my prayer life has just went the other way. I mean, just, just, you know, 
Uh, it just went the other way. I used to think the louder I prayed, the longer I prayed, and the more I prayed in the Spirit, the better it was. I mean, that might have been fine for that season, but that's not where he's at, and that's not what he's doing with me. As I draw near to him, he's moving all that stuff away from me and wanting to get this to me to this place where I can mourn for the things that he mourns. And he trusts me with it sometimes. He trusts me with that level of communication. But turn from their wicked way. Say that with me. Turn, turn from your wicked way. No, look at yourself and say, turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your wicked ways. Rend your hearts. How many times have you preached, you said, we're going to have a prayer meeting, and this is about you confessing your sin, rending your heart publicly, and telling everybody how dark and dirty things have been going on. How many people showing up for that? Ain't nobody coming. Right? There might be one. Maybe. I don't know. But according to this scripture, according to this scripture, unless you turn from your wicked ways, this verse don't work for you. Nor nobody else. I don't care, Brother Denny, how many goose pops you got during that prayer meeting. I don't care how filled you think you got during that meeting. If you don't do what it says, you don't get what it promises. Is, it, is that wrong? No, that's exactly right. If you don't do what the Word says, you don't get what the Word promises. Is that unreasonable? No. That's what it says. But see, we are like what A.W. Tozer said, and I got posted out there. We're fine with feeling good about our religious experience. But it's very inconvenient to be changed in our process. What are we going to do different than the previous generation did? We see and are the fruit of that generation. And many of them were believers. What are we going to do different? Maybe we should have a conference and say, what are we going to do different? Because what we're doing ain't getting us there. Then and only then, once you start doing what he says, then and only then is when he's going to hear in heaven. You see, there's a blockage. Confessing sin but not repenting, not returning to covenant and stopping the sin means that you're continuing to do the sin. So it means you continually need forgiveness for the sin. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that process as long as you don't stomp anywhere until it's done. You've got to keep going after it till it's done. There's been sinful patterns and habits in my life that I have sought God for years to get rid of. It took years to get rid of it. And I'm talking about that demonic spirit, water spirit, that used to cause me to masturbate. Took me years to get rid of that thing. Now I'm like 10 years past that. It's not even in the equation anymore, friends. Because when you continue in the truth, you know the truth, and the truth makes you free. But the key is you've got to continue. Say continue. continue. You got to if you want to make a difference, if you want to do something in this generation, but I got some good news for you. Coming. He will forgive your sins and heal your land. And prophetically, I'm changing time frames. Prophetically, this is going to take place. Prophetically, this place is going to be set straight. But it's not until the master comes and sits on a throne in Jerusalem and rules with a rod of iron. I don't know how that's going to feel, but he's going to rule with one. It's better to volunteer than to be put into pressure. I'm just telling you. We, you live in the volunteer state, right? Y'all all volunteers, aren't you? Shoot, we might get something to happen right now. We all volunteer to rend our hearts. Let God do it. When does a sin get forgiven? When does a land get healed? 
It's when they call on His name, when they humble themselves, when they pray, when they turn from their wicked ways. And see, that's the thing. I'm not against people. I'm not against prayer meetings. But if it's, if it's not changing you to become like Him, if, it's not, if you're not doing what it says to do, I don't know that it's of any value. It's just, it just makes you feel about good about who you are. Nothing really changes. You come back the same time the next time, and you do the same thing again. Now, <clears throat> I think that's what I was supposed to do when I changed that page. So I'm going back to the page I just flipped. This is Joel 2, 7, 12 uh, through 17, but I'm only reading 12 and 13. And this is the text. But I would read chapter 1, 1 through 20, Chapter 2, 2 through 17, and chapter 3 through 21, if you want the whole context of this verse. The two verses I'm reading. Verse 12 says, Yet even now, declares Jehovah, turn to me with all your heart, and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Fasting, weeping, and mourning. And tear your heart, and not your garments. And turn back to Jehovah, or go back to covenant. When you look at this stuff, it's always return to the covenant. And tear your heart and not your garments and turn to back to Jehovah your Elohim. For he shows favor and is compassionate, patient and of great loving commitment. And he shall relent concerning the evil. Tear your heart and not your garments. Say that with me. Tear your heart, heart not, your not, your garments. Garments. not your garments. See, I could take hold of my garments right now and rip them off. Wouldn't look too good, but I could do that. But that's something I can do. I can't rid my heart. I can't give myself regret over my sinful way. Repentance, as Susan is talking, it's a gift. If you get conviction of sin, it's a gift. Why is it a gift? Because he's trying to draw you near to him so that he can communicate to you who he is. Danny and I was talking about that earlier. You can, you can take a hold of your garments and rip them apart but neither you nor anyone else can rend their heart. Rending the heart is a matter of spiritual work of the Spirit of Jehovah. Now, <clears throat> I want to read one more verse, and I'm closing. Wow, I'm getting, time's getting away, but hallelujah. I just got four more verses, and then I'm closing. This is Psalm 106, 12 through 15. This is where I wanted to get today. Psalm 106, 12 through 15. This is the story of them trying to the going through the wilderness. The story of the children of Israel going into the wilderness. Verse 12 says, Then they believed his words, they sang his praise. Yahoo! But, don't say but, but verse 13 says, They soon forgot his works. And they did not wait for his counsel. They forgot what he did. They didn't wait for his counsel. But greedily lusted in the wilderness and tried El in the desert, or the mighty one. They tried him when they were lusting. They wanted meat. And he wasn't giving them meat. They weren't happy with manna because it was the same old, same old. <clears throat> Hello. You know, my God might give you the same thing to eat three times a day for 40 years. Huh? Would you complain about that? Huh? Would you complain if you had to eat the same thing three times a day, 40 years in a row? I'm saying probably so. So we ain't too far from them, are we? Listen to the next verse. Verse 15. And he gave them their requests. What they want? Meat. They got meat. But look what they also got. He gave them their requests, but sent leanness into their soul. You know, and I don't know why, but every verse I'm reading in the last few days, he spoke to me 25, 30 years ago, man. I just, I'm not trying to make that up, trying to be spiritual. He knows what the truth is. But he sent leanness to the soul. The fear of Jehovah came on me. I was praying about something every one of y'all prayed about. I was praying about, where's that woman I'm supposed to marry? That's what I was praying about at this time. He said, I can give you a wife, but you'll get leanness into your soul. 
if you take the wrong one. Now, what does leanness in my soul mean? I mean, I don't sound all that bad. Huh? I mean, it doesn't sound too bad. I'm telling you, the fear of Jehovah came on me. This is probably in 92 or something. I've been single a long time at that point. I wouldn't take nothing for it either. But I wouldn't take nothing for being married either. Because that's what's happening now. It's a good thing. Yeah, oh man. That's quite the story itself, ain't it, honey? Too cute to be with, ain't you? <laughs> that's what I said. But he sent leanness into their being. Listen to me. Every one of you are dealing with this. Every one of you are dealing with this. There are things you need. There are things you want. They're not wrong in and of themselves. But if we just spend our time asking Him for what we want, He gives us what we want, but sends emptiness. He sends emptiness into your spirit, man, where you don't want Him anymore. That's what happened to that whole generation that left Israel, that left Egypt with great signs and wonders, great provision, supernatural Passover feast, first time ever. Saw all of their enemies drowned in the sea. They weren't coming back no more. And they got what they wanted, but they had to give up their desire for God. Hello? You want everything that you want? Well, he'll give it to you. But you won't want him as a result because he don't put things in a full basket. He ain't foolish. You got your hands full? There's no place for him to put anything. You got your heart full? There's no place to put anything. You want all this stuff, desire all this stuff? You say, yeah, I got a verse and a promise for it. And your heart's full of it. But what you'll give up to get all that stuff is you won't want him. You won't want him enough to pay whatever it takes to get what he really wants to give you. Oh, yeah, you can be religious. You can do a lot of stuff. But if you give in to getting your request and that's your goal, you'll get it. But that's all you're going to get. You're not going to get him. And see, I know we've been taught different. We've been taught get everything you can and get everybody to give you everything they can or something like that. But what he wants is you and me to want him and what he wants. And I'm telling you, there's physical healing by returning to the covenant. There's physical healing by just returning to the covenant. Gosh, I wish I could read this other text today. <coughs> Hallelujah. I believe what God's going to give you and I today to, to receive if you want it. Is He wants to restore that longing. He wants to do something permanent, eternal in each and every one of us today. He wants to restore the longing yes. for Him. The longing simply and completely for Him. That's what 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is about. is returning to Him. If I believe He said today He wants to restore your longing. You know, it may be what you're talented to do. You may be a great intellectual person. There's nothing wrong with that. But when that takes precedent, your gift takes precedent, your spiritual gift takes precedent, any of those kind of things, and you crave it and you want more and more, you don't get, you get leanness in your soul. Your being doesn't want God like it's the only thing on the planet. So, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. So, hmm? So if you just, if you want to pray that, I'm going to pray a prayer out. Just ask Father to show us and put it in our hearts. If he wants to do it, and we believe it. And we're willing to get it. He's willing to give it to us. Father, I believe you're willing to restore our longing. I believe you're willing to restore our longing today. 
And Father, I don't know how you're going to navigate that in my life or anybody else's life. But we need to return to a longing for you. We need to really get right with you. We need to really rend our hearts. Father, we may be the only one that ever does it, but give us the grace. If we're the only one that ever does it, give us the grace to deal with it. Father, I just pray in Yeshua's name. Amen.